I'm just going to pray for Monica um, as she brings God's words to us. <sighs> Father, I thank you that you provide all good things. Um, and I thank you that you've provided a message for Monica to share with us this morning. I ask that you would give her peace and clarity as she speaks your words, um, and you would give us receptive hearts, um, that we would hear the words that you have for each of us as individuals and as a community. Um, yeah, thank you, and I ask that you would bless Monica for the time and the effort and the heart that she has put into preparing this this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Don't forget your coffee. <laughs> Else I might steal it. <laughs> all right. Um, great to see all of you. It's a beautiful day today. I hope we get to enjoy the, you get to go out and enjoy the weather. It's like 21 degrees or something in October. It's crazy. Um, I'm Monica, like I was introduced. Uh, I serve on the board. I also serve on the prayer team here. And I've been at this church just over six years now with my husband, Matt. He's right there, he's the best. <laughs> Go say hi to him and, uh, no, okay. <laughs> he's also an introvert and I love him for that. So, um, it's really a privilege to get to share from Matthew 5, 10 to 16. So we're going to leave off where we were last week, which was in the last beatitude. So I'm just going to read it, if we can put it up on the screen. I'm reading from the English Standard Version. You might notice some differences if you are reading from another version, but they're basically pretty similar. So let's open up your Bibles to Matthew 5, 10 to 16. So verse 10, blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Salt and light. You are the salt of the earth, but if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. I'm just going to set my timer here because I, uh, I can get carried away, so it's important to say <laughs> so you're not here all day. No, I won't do that to you. Um, all right. So... This is our last Beatitude. We've talked about the Beatitudes the last two Sundays, I believe. So this is, a, this is a tough Beatitude. I don't know if it grates you in a certain way, but blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. It's interesting because when I was studying this, I, and I'm going to go with this angle on it, most of the commentators say that Verse 10 is actually the final beatitude. And verses 11 and 12 are actually an explanation of verse 10, or a more of a description of the truth of the message. So we see in verse 11, Jesus is saying, you are blessed. And this is interesting. The word for blessed, it's actually, it's not just blessed. It's like supremely blessed. <laughs> it's like extra blessed. So you are extra blessed when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil on the account of Jesus. And then you're called to rejoice and be glad, <laughs> for great is your reward in heaven. So, like, I don't know how that sits with you. 
like when you think about, I just want to focus on the word revile here. Um, that's not a word we use often. In the ESV, it's the word onadizo, um, or sorry, it's the Greek word onadizo. And it means to defame, rail at, chide, taunt, suffer reproach, find fault with someone, scold, be disgraced. <laughs> it's not a very nice thing to experience someone reviling you. And then Jesus is saying, but you're supremely blessed. So, yeah, it, my, I don't know about you, when someone is reviling me, it's happened, sadly. Um, I've experienced a family member who verbally attacked me. Um, it's not my immediate reaction to say, wow, I feel so blessed. <laughs> Thank you for that verbal assault. <laughs> it's just not, you know, our natural reaction in our flesh. It's actually, uh, I, I don't know about you, if that happens to me, I, I get angry. I, uh, I'm upset. You know, in that particular instance, I'm thinking of the Holy Spirit, thankfully, prompted me to just say nothing, because nothing good was going to come out. <laughs> but afterwards, like, ooh. I had some things I wish I could have said, you know? And I think what, it's, I don't think Jesus is trying to be cruel here when he's saying, you know, just, just get over it. Just be blessed. Just rejoice. That's not, he's not undermining the pain of suffering from someone um, saying evil or speaking falsely about you. He's actually, I think, giving us a vision for it, that through it, he can do something good. Even through something as painful as that, he can do, bring good. He can bring out more of his character in us when we go through this kind of thing. And I was reading in Matthew 5, 43 to 48, and it was in the message translation, and this really encouraged me. And I hope it encourages you to give you a vision of the good that Jesus can bring when we suffer persecution in a verbal form um, or, yeah, people making up things about us. You're familiar with the old written law, love your friend, and, it is, and it's unwritten companion, hate your enemy. Jesus says this, I'm challenging that. I tell you to love your enemies. Let them bring out the best in you, not the worst. So when someone is giving you a hard time, responding with the supple moves of prayer, for then you are working out of your true selves, your God-created self. So that's in Matthew 5, 43 to 48 in the message. But just that phrase like, let them bring out the best in you, not the worst. It's, <laughs> I don't know about you, that's so challenging to me. It's like... Wow, that's the Beatitudes, I don't know how you found them last few weeks, but it just brings us into this higher calling. It brings us like into this depth of character where we're just so aligned with Christ. And it's not in our own strength. It's only by the this is this is why the Beatitudes are so challenging. Our flesh and our nature, we get upset, we get angry, we want to hit back. But the Holy Spirit is saying. And what Jesus is inviting us into is actually something that is a miracle to experience that kind of thing and say, Lord, bless them. <laughs> and to feel like you are supremely blessed for suffering in that way for Christ. And that it brings out the best in you and not the worst. So preparing this, I was like really convicted and I was like, I'm not like this, Lord. This is a, something you're going to have to keep working in my character to bring me to this place. Um, and one of the commentators actually put it this way, because this convicted me even more when I was reading what he was saying. It was Martin Lloyd-Jones. He said, when facing persecution, a Christian is different, different in nature. He or she must not retaliate. This is the nature of the flesh, to have the instinct of self-preservation or the desire to hit back 
right? That's that knee jerk, hit back. But Jesus isn't content with just us not saying the angry thing. He also calls us to something even harder, which is not harboring resentment. It's the vision of becoming the kind of person where you get to a place of not even resenting persecution. Whew. So, like, think about what Jesus said on the cross. He was, like, literally dying on the cross. And he says, does anyone know what he says? For they don't know what they're doing. Like, it's not something we can do. It's only by the grace of God, only by the miracle of the work of God in us. And yeah, I'm praying for that to become more of a reality in my life. Like this was really convicting for me to, to study this. Um, but another aspect I just want to emphasize lastly of the vision of the purpose of why Jesus invites us to rejoice and be glad there's many aspects I could talk about, but can't for the sake of time. But I don't know if you've ever really wrestled with the concept of identifying with Christ and his suffering. It's not something we like to talk about in the Western world. We like our comfort, and we like things to be, you know, manageable. <laughs> but something that, like, the early church and churches that these days suffer persecution is... There is this depth where they actually want to identify with Christ in that way, in the way of suffering. And it's kind of like, I don't know if you've had this, where you've gone through something really bad, like a breakup or the death of a loved one or a health scare. But, you know, when you meet someone else who has gone through something similar, there's sort of this natural connection of affinity with that person like you can almost bond over the hardship that you went through. And it's this similar with Jesus where there's this paradox of having joy with being able to identify with him and how he suffered to get to know him more intimately in that way. Because Jesus suffered some of the worst kind of treatment. If you read the Gospels, he was, like, he was whipped, mocked, taunted, jeered at, spit on, and then he went to his end on a cross and he said like father forgive them and that same Jesus when you have the Holy Spirit lives in us and he can actually give us the power through his spirit the comfort the love we need to walk through something like obviously not to the degree he's experienced but that hardship that you bond over in that area where they where you've suffered um, he's also suffered in that area. And so I think that's just something to get, I know it's not an easy thing to talk about, but I just, I wanted to challenge us with this, and I was really challenged, and just invite us to consider, yeah, how we respond and what Jesus calls us to and a vision for the character we can have in the face of this kind of persecution, which so when people, yeah, can say things badly about you, they can make up lies, or they can revile you, just really not like you in any kind of way. And it's for the sake of Christ. And so I'm going to share a story later about a girl I know who's actually in a close country right now. Um, and I hope that it encourages you and helps to bring this sermon together because she is just such an example of me, to me, of this, but also of being salt and light, which is the next part we're going to look at. So wrapping up our time in the Beatitudes, again, the Beatitudes have given us a vision for what our character can look like in Christ. And then as we move on, we now see here in verses 13 to 16, this understanding of the witness of the Christian in the world. So Again, I, I love casting vision, but I just, I really hope through this that you gain a vision for your place in God's mission in the world. And yeah, even in the face of whatever you're facing, um, in pers yeah, persecution, verbal, or in other ways, it's an opportunity that you can be salt and light in the world. So I'm just going to read verses 13 to 16 again. 
and we'll get into it. So you can open it up again if you want. Matthew 5, 13 to 16. You are the salt of the earth, but if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. So there's two metaphors here, salt and light, right? What first stood out to me, though, verse 13 and 14, you are. You are. Isn't that cool? Jesus is saying, this is about your identity. You are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. It's not, one of the commentators said, it's not you ought to be. He very well could have put that there. You ought to be. He says, no, you are. That speaks to your identity in Christ. So these metaphors, honestly, they're pretty straightforward. <laughs> like, I did some study, but let, let's just do a little interaction here. Okay. What does salt do? Let's hear, what, is, what do you think of? Flavor. Seas yeah, seasoning. Anything else? Preserves. Preserves. Yeah. Anyone else? Yeah. Yep. Purifying. Healing. Yep. Electrical. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that was not in the commentators, but very good. <laughs> um, anything else? Salt. Melt. Melt ice. I didn't even... That's cool. <laughs> so it's pretty straightforward, this, this metaphor. Like... But one thing I want to emphasize, yeah, salt preserves, it purifies, it brings flavor. Um, some of the, if you look into the historical context, like they would take salt from the Dead Sea and actually add it to sacrifices in the temple. You could take what you want from that too. But salt doesn't exist for itself. And in the same way, Christians do not exist for their own benefit. Isn't that cool? Like you don't, I don't know, does anyone... Does anyone eat salt? Like pour it on a plate? Like, yeah, dinner. No, it's, it's for the meat. It's for the food, right? <laughs> salt is for something. So I think that's just, some, I just really wanted to emphasize that. It's also really cool because salt is what it is, like how it functions and what it is is primarily connected. It's not really got any other function in that way. So, um, and it's interesting, it says in verse 13, there's a warning attached to salt, though. In, we see in, in the next verse, there's an encouragement, but here there's a warning. So, there's a warning of losing your saltiness, which could mean lacking faithfulness as a disciple, being a lax disciple, a loss in purpose or function. So I guess just to, to kind of bring it to a place where we can apply it, I, I feel like salt, it, what Jesus is saying here is it's the concentration of your influence as a follower of Jesus. And it's, again, connected to your identity. You are the salt of the earth. So it's wherever you go, if you have Jesus in your life, this will happen. It will permeate. There will be influence. I don't know if you've ever had it, like, I have uh, a lot of non-Christian, well, family members, and as soon as you're around them, it's like all of a sudden they swear, and they're like, oh, sorry, like, ugh, like, and I'm like, I, I, I honestly don't care, but okay, like, cool, um, and I don't, it's not like I preach at them, it's just, I'm just around, and they have this, like, oh, I shouldn't do that. And it's like, what? It, it's just this influence of the, cons like your pres the presence of Jesus in you 
in wherever you go, your workplace, your school, life. I mean, that's just one example of the swearing thing, but you have that influence as a follower of Christ. You bring that light, which we'll talk about now, the light of the world. So, <laughs> one of the commentators said, the light metaphor has a promise attached for anxious disciples, right? So we saw the warning of the salt. You can lose your saltiness. But some of us, we, a warning is just going to push us further. We need an encouragement that it's actually not up to us, that our effectiveness is not up to us. So light, again, let's talk about what does light do? Metaphors, speak it out. What do you think of when you think of light? Drives out darkness. Yes. Say again. Shows beauty. Shows beauty? Yeah. Be yeah. Helps us have direction. We can see. <laughs> Not walking in darkness. That's good. Anything else? Brings clarity. Brings clarity. Yes. Oh. Warmth. Yeah. Yeah. The light, fire. Were you guys had something? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Anyone else? What does light do? Huh? For yeah, we need. Yeah, wow, plants need it. You guys are way better than the commentators, honestly. Like, I read stuff, I'm like, hmm, yeah, okay. <laughs> For growing food, yeah. The photosynthesis, that's really cool. So, uh, I really liked this quote. Um, again, similar to salt, light is light. Both what it is and how it functions is primarily connected. So the essential characteristic of light is that it gives light. <laughs> and it has no other function other than to do that. And the moment it ceases to not be light, it, it, it isn't light. So that's it's what it is. <laughs> There's three metaphors we see here in verses 14 to 16. You see a city on a hill. So there's the image of the city on the hill. There's the lamp on a stand in a house to give light to the house. And then we see it in verse 16 as a metaphor for good works. I also liked what one of the commentators said. Uh, he said, it exposes darkness. Light, ex so in the Apostle Paul says, light exposes the hidden things of darkness. So think about that. <laughs> when you walk into somewhere and the light of Christ in you exposes the darkness, what could happen? Think about verses 10, 11, 12. Persecution. Yeah. People could get uncomfortable. They could not like that exposure. None of us like to be exposed. <laughs> we want, that's some of our greatest fears, is to be exposed, right? Um, and light, when it exposes, it often will explain or show the cause of darkness. Maybe it's selfishness self-seeking behavior, ultimately it's all pointing back to the sin in our world, right? And the sin in us. And it shows, like you said, it, the light also provides a way out of darkness. It shows us the way forward. I want to read Ephesians 5, 9. For at one time you were darkness. Now just close your eyes when you listen to this, actually, if you want. Ephesians 5, 9. For at one time you were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of the light. It's, it's, like a, it's honestly such a miracle when we have Christ. Like, I don't know about you, but you read this verse 14, you are the light of the world. Just, just let that sit with you for a second. Jesus says to you, you are the light of the world. That's extraordinary. That's, it's like, Jesus, God calls himself the light. God created light. And he's saying your identity as a follower of Jesus is being the light of the world. We get so used to hearing this stuff, right? Oh, you're the light of the world. But like, think about it. That's incredible. Um, 
Lloyd-Jones says, not only have we received light, we have been made light. We become transmitters of light. We become beacons of Christ's light in the world. So, yeah. Jesus came into the world. He came to save us from the darkness in ourselves, the darkness in our world. He came to give us a new nature, a new life, to make us children of God, children of light. And if you're a follower of Jesus, you've been called out of darkness into light. You now have the light of Christ. You are the light of the world. I'm going to share a story. Um, I have a friend. I haven't been in touch with her for a long time. I'm going to call her Lisa because she lives in China. And as many of you know, um, China is a place where if you're a Christian, you can be imprisoned for it or worse. Um, and the only way you can meet as a church is underground. So back in 2013, I met this girl, Lisa. She was on campus. I was a campus ministry intern at SFU. And she was an international student. She, she was just already seeking Jesus. It was just like one of those chance meetings. I don't know if you've ever had it. It was it's been the only time for me where I've literally met someone who was like ready to receive Jesus and like just got to be that person who's like, here's the door, like, there you go, go ahead. But she had just come to Canada. She'd been to church for the first time. She was drawn to like the singing in the church, the symbol of the cross. She felt this peace she had never known when she was sitting in a church and she heard this sermon about how God loved her and told, and then as she, after she heard it, she told God, you know, I wanna know you more. And she asked him to please tell her who he was. And then the next week, it was like this chance meeting at SFU and God was already working in her life and she wanted a relationship with Jesus. And, and I was like, okay, so you know, you share the gospel and then you're like, so do you want to think about it? You know, you want to, I could come back next week. We could, we could, but she was like, no, I've, I, this is what I want. Like I've, I've been, I want Jesus in my life. And I was like, wow, okay. You know, you just, you just go with it. And so then we got to pray together and she took that step to receive Jesus in her life. And then she got connected in with the church. She started, yeah, reading her new Chinese English Bible, and then a coworker and I were meeting her every Friday. We'd study the Bible. We were teaching her some foundations of the Christian faith. And she was involved in another ministry on campus too. She got baptized. And she was just such an inspiration to me. Like, <laughs> she would tell her classmates about Jesus. Like, this is SFU, okay? This is like, <laughs> it's pretty hard to be a Christian there. And, you know, her, her professors, they were like, wow, Lisa, you've done so well in your grades. Like, you went from the bottom of the class to the top of their class. And she's like, oh, yeah, Jesus helped me. And he changed my life, and he can change yours, too. And, like, telling her professors. And I was like, oh, wow. <laughs> like, they mark your grades. Like, wow. Okay. Whew. But, you know, she just was this light. And she was heading home to China for a month to visit her parents, and I had no idea she had this plan, um, but she had this idea that she wanted to share Jesus with her friends back in China. Now that's illegal. But she wanted to do it. Um, so she, she's a aspiring uh, university professor. She probably is one now, by now. But she loves teaching and she loves like creating, you know, environments. And so she invited 50 of her friends over to her house, five zero. And her parents helped her. Her parents weren't Christians. One, her dad was like a Buddhist, but they gave them food. They did some activities that introduced them to who God was. Um, like they had like Bible verses on rocks and like creative activities and like different things she told me about. And you know, most people in China are taught from a very young age, there's no God, right? That's the reality they are taught. And at the end, she shared with them how Jesus had come into her life and how she had a relationship with him and that they can have one too. 
and how they can be sons and daughters of God and how they can follow Jesus. And then when she finished telling them, 29 of their 50 friends told her they wanted to follow Jesus. <laughs> and then she gave them all Bibles, another illegal thing to do. Um, and next week she brought back, so she was there for a month, so she planned this all out. So she brought back the 29 to teach them. And then they had some stories of people they were telling about Jesus who wanted to know him. And it was just like, I, she told me this. And you know, you're probably hearing me you're like, this is hard to believe. I found it hard to believe. I was like, wow, are you serious? But this is like the hunger in China for the gospel, for the light, for Jesus, right? And so she helped her friends connect to underground churches there um, because the government regulates any visible church. And I just, I don't know about you, but she is such a beautiful example, like such an inspiration to me of what Jesus is saying. You are the salt of the earth. You are the light on a hill. You are the light of the world. And I think it also illustrates our beatitude we just looked at because 21 of her 50 friends didn't want to follow Jesus, right? I don't know how they felt. They could have thought, Lisa went to Canada and she's really weird like oh, heaven like they could have been talking behind her back reviling her they could have spread false stories about her they could have even reported her to the authorities like report them her to the government but none of that mattered to her because she wanted to share about Jesus she wanted to shine her light and the possibility of any kind of suffering in that regard mattered less, right? So she wanted to let her light, the light of Christ, shine before others and not hide it. It would have been safer to hide it. Just go home four weeks, have a break, like hide. Nope. I don't know. Her courage and her faith to share in such a spiritually dark place like China, I think God responded. He did something special in that simple act of courage and faith. And so, yeah, just as we close here, I just want us to focus again, salt of the earth, light of the world. When you follow him, when you walk out that identity in Christ, that you are the salt of the earth, you are the light of the world, when you're led by the Holy Spirit, Jesus will make an impact. He will influence people. That one step of obedience, like that random meeting with her in 2013, I didn't know the breadth of that meeting, the impact that could have. She didn't know the impact that her sharing would have back with her friends. And honestly, we won't ever really know the impact our life has. We won't know until the full impact of the life of Jesus working through us as salt and light until we're in heaven one day and we get to meet all the people that were impacted by our life and our light in Christ. So I think it ties also back into verse 10 and 12. Theirs is the kingdom of heaven, that your reward will be great in heaven. And so however God is leading you, a step of faith, a kind word, trying to just to connect with someone who looks lonely or looks like they need to talk to someone, you know, offering to pray for someone, just taking a little step of faith, despite however you might suffer <laughs> in doing that, Jesus will meet you in that, and he can do some pretty special things, even here in Vancouver. <laughs> and so I hope that encourages you today, that little step, God will meet you, and you might not see someone turn from darkness to light in front of you, but there's an impact. There's something that will have happened that could lead. You might just be one person on that person's journey, right? You might be the person at the beginning who just gets them thinking about Jesus. And then 10 steps down, they meet someone who actually leads them. And so, yeah, I just want to encourage you. I hope you are inspired. Feel free to ask any questions after if you want to come talk to me. 
I also just want to preface, like, if you're new, if you're here today and you're just exploring Jesus or you're new to the Christian faith, like, really would love to meet you, get to know you, answer any questions you have. I know a sermon like this can bring up a lot of questions, and I was speaking more to Christians. But, yeah, just come and talk with me or Pastor Chris or Laura if that's something that you're curious about, you want to ask more. But let me just pray for us as we, uh, yeah process this. So Lord, thank you for the story that, uh, yeah, this story of Lisa's life. Um, And it's not, it's a reality of just how she stepped out and how it inspires us. Thank you for the promises that we are the salt of the earth, that we are the light of the world. Thank you that you are with us, even in the face of false accusations or people speaking ill words in your name against us or for you, Lord, that we stand. um, Yeah, that I pray that you would help us to stand and not to be afraid. I pray that you would um, just stir our hearts if there are ways that Maybe we've just hidden our light. And I just pray that you, by your Holy Spirit, would just do a work today of just calling us back into that identity of being salt and light. And that we would, um, yeah, trust you and follow you and just obey in the simple little ways as we go about our day and our weeks in the places you've called us to influence. So pray this in your name, Jesus. Amen.